Today, I'm gonna to give you an hour, uh, an hour of my insight, an hour of the research that I can find that has presented in the last two years on chronic pain. Now, some of this is directly chronic pain. Some of this is the stuff that we see in our office every single day that we may not recognize as chronic pain or has the potential to go to chronic pain. So it's our ability to recognize these things when they happen, to understand how chronic pain uh, presents, what's the etiology, and then all the insertion points, all the cool little pieces of chronic pain and peripheralization of pain that really makes us tick, that makes us great at what we do. So today I'm gonna to provide a, a roadmap on how pain is perceived, how we learn to be in pain. I'm going to provide a roadmap on what we, as evidence-based chiropractors, do so well for this condition. And then maybe give you some ideas on other people in your community that can also assist you on your journey uh, with your patient to get them out of their pain. So today is gonna to be a little less on methods and techniques. It's gonna be a little bit more on principles of chronic pain and the things that we can do for these patients. Uh, this is going to be uh, a, an hour long and I'm gonna to try to separate my opinion from the facts. So the facts would be more the things that we see in research. The opinions would be things that I see as far as my experience, which sometimes are equally as important. Uh, so we all see these patients and I think if we're in a position to accept the immense responsibility of treating these patients, we should at least know what we're talking about. We should be sure not to unintentionally facilitate pain uh, rather than treat pain. This is a big deal though, because here's what I see in my practice, and I'm, I'm sure you see the same thing. We see an x-ray that looks like this, and this x-ray uh, doesn't look great if you had to be a hip. Um, however, in the absence of trauma, in the absence of red flags, uh, what we know is that structure and for the most part function have very little correlation with pain. So when I look at this x-ray, I can't say this person has right hip pain. So we assess for structure. We assess for function. Uh, we do this to label our patients and, and we do have to do that. We have to tell a patient what's wrong with them. We have to tell the insurance company what's wrong with them. Uh, so we have to be nice and label their dysfunction. The problem is it's wrong. The problem is, is that structure and that function are not directly related to that pain in most cases. So we have to be sure that we know what's going on, how that pain started, so we can explain several things to our patient. So what can we do for chronic pain patients first? The first most important piece of this is explain how anatomy does not equal pain. Physiology does. Now, anatomy is important. Uh, don't throw it out the window. However, it's a subset of their pain. We have to teach them how their body learns to be in pain. We have to teach them the difference between hurt and harm. And then as a practitioner, and, and sometimes the hardest part about this, is we have to develop a hierarchy. And this hierarchy is looking at the multiple insertion points of therapy, of education, of uh, uh, rehabilitation exercises, and we can look at these three potential sites of pain propagation and figure out what to do with these patients. So let me explain. Because we've all had this patient, not specifically this patient right here. However, you've had this patient right here, and I call them a check mark patient. You'll see them on a Wednesday, and on a Wednesday they come in and their pain is a 10 out of 10. Let's say they have uh, lumbar spine stenosis, a neurogenic claudication. They have headaches that have been debilitating for 12 years without any kind of relief. And their tissue injury is pretty severe and their pain duration is pretty long, greater than three, greater than six months. Here's the problem, is that they come back in on Friday when you see them again and they listen to you, they did your exercise, they followed your advice, whatever you did for them in your, uh, your patient um, office visit. And they come back in and they're in that green star right there. And they're 90% better. Well, there's nothing that you can do. There's nothing that I can do to change structure that fast, especially in the degenerative world. 
So something doesn't add up, something doesn't correlate. Now the pain drops so much, but symptoms and tissue injury uh, really don't uh, go hand in hand in this situation. There's gotta be two options. Here's option number one. Uh, we have magical hands. Uh, we have healing hands. Uh, let's agree that's not the case. Let's agree that it's part of the component though, it's part of the process. Um, that we have to understand that persistent pain uh, doesn't exist without cause. It doesn't exist or, or it can't be marginalized just based on their head. There's something to it. There's something that we can do for them to significantly help their symptoms. And fortunately for us, possibly unfortunate for the patient, uh, here's what happens to that patient if they come into our office and all we do is provide passive care. They come back on Monday and they're way up here at a 30 out of 10. So after you went home, you cut off all the tags of your mattresses, you bought lottery tickets, you were feeling pretty lucky. They come back in on Monday and said, I'm no better, you're just the next chiropractor who didn't help me. Well, that's bad for them. Um, however, should set off a little bit of a check engine light with you. And it should say, you know, tissue injury, um, structural changes, functional adaptations, um, didn't work that fast. So their structure, their function could not have changed that fast. But what did happen? What happened from Wednesday to Monday that helped that person get better? Uh, because it wasn't their degenerative stenosis. Um, it has to be something quick acting and it has to be the circuitry. It's the circuitry. It's, it's their, um, uh, their education, the third order neuron. It's their brain in this case. Uh, you gave them hope. You gave them a plan. You gave them confidence in your diagnosis and what you're gonna do for that patient. You acted upon one insertion point in their chronic pain pathway, and you made it a phenomenal uh, experience for that person on day one. Now, unfortunately, it didn't carry on through the weekend. However, uh, this process should give us information that we can parlay into our future treatments for these patients. It can be explained through a learned mechanism of pain. Uh, we always have learned this, especially I learned this, that pain is always mediated from the bottom up, meaning um, this situation. That a uh, kid falls down and scrapes his knee. A uh, kid learns that that hurts. Uh, he has blood running down his knee. And that's how pain is mediating. But the simple fact is that that's not the only way we have chronic pain. And that's not the only way we react to pain based on a physical event. You can learn to be in pain based off your experiences. And if you really think about it, um, that this is something that we can see on a day-to-day -day basis. And we can see this frequently. Now, for us, before I get into that, the cool part about this is when you look at there's a pain medicine study by Wheat in 2020, that if you see a chiropractor first and you see someone who's willing to manage your pain conservatively, those patients are 30 times less likely to fill an opioid prescription which has detrimental effects. We won't get into that for the scope of this webinar. However, your education, your understanding of these conditions can affect chronic pain, it's powerful. So one thing that I would say is that yes, treat from the bottom up, treat Johnny here, put a Band-Aid on him, hug him. However, they can also mediate pain from the bottom down. Let's explain. We're all gonna look at a picture together. And that picture is going to actually affect the peripheralization of symptoms. Uh, and he here it is. Um, here's a snake. You see a snake. I see a snake. Uh, we all see a snake. Um, how did you respond though? Some people will uh, uh, go back from their screen and they're surprised. They don't want to see that. However, there's other people that look at that snake and that's their friend. That's what they play with. This, this stimulus, the, the feel, the touch, um, the sight of a snake, um, they enjoy. Uh, now, I, at the age of 12, was bit by a water moccasin. I uh, flew off a jet ski and uh, I was in a, a river in um, uh, North Carolina, right, or the mouth of a creek. And um, I have a very different response to seeing a snake. Um, I have an experience that leads me to believe snakes are bad. Not saying that's right or wrong. However, that experience leads to stimulation in my body. And that pattern of stimulation creates an autonomic response, creates a fight or flight response, uh, but can also actually create a painful response. 
This is the process of learning that we're going to talk about today. Uh, that this stimulus can create a physiologic response both from the bottom up and the, uh, and the, the top down. Uh, so just emotions can create pain. So we have to reshape our patient's emotions on certain aspects of what we do. And here's the cool part about it. It's really not that hard. It's built into our rehab. I'm going to give you very simple strategies to help patients with these problems. So most of us see pain in this situation. So we see a kid fall in this kind of uh, situation um, where we have a kid, um, he's on a bike in this situation and he falls down. If any of you have kids, what's that kid going to do? Is that kid going to instantly look down at his knee and start crying? Or is the first time he does that, is he going to quickly look up and to see what his mom or dad are doing? He's going to look around for friends. How are they responding to this situation? That's going to determine on how much severity his brain says, hey, this is a big deal or this is not a big deal. When he sees the blood running down his leg and he feels a burning sensation, he doesn't know what that is. He has to interpret how to respond to that and put a hierarchy how severe this is. I have a skin knee. I have my fibula hanging out the side of my leg. And he will now learn about this situation based on his body's response, based on his visual cues. So the first thing is he's going to learn what's going on through um, a stimulation. Uh, our peripheral tissues uh, have inflammatory cytokines, mostly prostaglandins, which I, I put here, but there's more. Um, and his peripheral tissue is going to say, hey, Johnny, there's a problem. Uh, the inside of you is now bleeding to the outside of you. And the nerves are going to say, well, we need to tell Johnny where he's hurt. And that first order neuron is going to go all the way back into the dorsal horn of the spinal cord and the substantia gelatinosa. And it's going to say, Johnny, we need to send this signal instantly up to the brain because we have a serious situation. Once the brain picks up from the thalamus, the third order neuron heads over to the, um, uh, the cortex and say, where exactly is this uh, happening? Uh, so our brain is able to differentiate and to put a hierarchy over these pains, uh, but it involves the first, second, and th third order neurons. So we have to take this into consideration whenever we're treating patients because a lot of these principles apply to us in practice. Let me explain that. Our patients don't often fall off a bike in our practice, but what do they have? They have shoulder pain, they have back pain, they have neck pain. And what happens is, just like John is going to learn to ride his bike more careful, this patient with shoulder pain is now going to move differently because of his or her pain. Well, that's a problem because if, you know, we'll call him a John, uh, if John has shoulder pain and it hurts when he picks up his arm at 90 degrees, that's maybe okay for a week. However, if it impacts his daily life, if it impacts the way he sleeps, if it um, changes the way he moves, if he see, takes an opioid, if he takes medication, uh, if he stops picking up his grandchildren, he is going to make decisions based off of that pain. And while they may not seem like a big deal now, these things can add up later. Someone who's not sleeping well and in constant pain, they can go down a very different pathway than if they see a practitioner that's able to triage it and treat it effectively and efficiently. So the really the question is, how capable are you, am I, as our profession, at really putting people in the right buckets? And instead of just treating shoulder pain, how good are we at learning why someone's in pain, identifying the right tissue that's hurt, and then going about treating it as efficiently, as effectively as possible? And I think this is where we, we get into uh, the different classes of practitioners, is that most of us do an evaluation and we do a history. And some of us do it thoroughly, some of us not so well uh, after several years of being uh, in our practice. And let's say your evaluation and your history, you come up with a diagnosis of shoulder pain or shoulder strain. And John's been having this shoulder pain for um, seven weeks and he's had this pain for a while and, and you go in and you palpate it and you say he's got some manip or some segmental dysfunction of cervical and thoracic spine and maybe some chura points in the infraspinatus and teres minor and the upper trapezius and you go about fixing those problems. Uh, that's one way to classify people. 
The next class of practitioners are going to say, yeah, we're going to do that. We're going to take this history. Um, however, we're also going to do an uh, uh, orthopedic evaluation, a functional evaluation, uh, the right set of imaging. And let's say you get the actual diagnosis of a shoulder problem. It's an impingement syndrome. It's a rotator cuff tear. It's a, it's a slap lesion. Um, then you can really start to identify what's going on as far as physically with the patient. But let's say you ask a couple more questions. You spend a little bit more time with the patient. One, two, three minutes. I'm not talking about a half an hour. And you learn that that patient's been having their pain for four years. It's been intermittent. It happens uh, five to six times a year. It always happens when he picks up his arm over his head uh, multiple times in a day or throws a baseball. Uh, you know that it's worse with sleeping. So by getting that extra information from the patient helps identify, is this an acute problem? Is this a chronic problem? And what we can do when we identify all these things that are happening to create this patient's problem is that we can actually get a, a little bit of a, a label. And like I said, the labels aren't great, but we need these labels. These labels are uh, critical as far as identifying what's wrong with the patient and what we're going to do about it. So uh, I really think that this uh, evaluation is, uh, is important to come up with the exact problem, not just shoulder pain, but shoulder uh, rotator cuff syndrome that is chronic, that's a tendinosis, um, and is worse with sleeping and, and worse with overhead activities because uh, that's how you're going to get the person out of pain and keep them out of pain. It's not just being generic with everything that we do. What happens though when you see a patient and you treat every shoulder pain like a sprain and strain? So John comes in and Billy comes in and uh, Susan comes in and all of them have pain right here and you treat every single one of those the exact same like a sprain and strain. You're nice to it. You put some ice on it. Uh, you tell them to take some anti-inflammatory uh, anti-inflammatory diet, anti-inflammatory supplements um, or any kind of medication to get things to die down. You tell them to rest maybe. That's important. Um, let's say it's been going on for a while. You can provide manipulation. Absolutely 100% manipulation is critical in this kind of a patient with rotator cuff syndrome. Um, and we know that a lot of them have radiculopathy on top of it. However, if you treat every patient the exact same, that's as far as you're going to get. You will have some success. You will also have some failure. Let's say you go one step further and do an evaluation. You do an orthopedic evaluation. You spend an extra 45 seconds with that patient. You come with a diagnosis of a, of a partial tear. And you say, oh my gosh, we did some imaging. And you have a partial tear in your shoulder. Well, if you're not keeping up to date with the literature, you don't know that's, the, that's your ballpark. Evidence-based practitioner in musculoskeletal care, that's us. Uh, we're not sending those people out for anything else. If you don't know what to do as far as the rehab, as far as rotator cuff syndrome, and we instantly ship them off to another provider, guess what they're going to get? Uh, this patient that has rotator cuff tendinosis now gets an injection. Well, that injection didn't do anything. In fact, it, it limited the amount of inflammation. Uh, it, it's, it's delaying the healing response. It's weakening the tissue. Let's say then you send them to a, um, an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, what are they going to get? Uh, the same way that you know, I get paid to evaluate and manipulate, orthopedic and nurses get paid to operate. Uh, so I get it. Uh, however, when you look at a Cochrane review in 2019, surgery offers very little to no clinical benefit to patients with rotator cuff syndrome. So if we're not dealing with it, how, what do we do with these patients to prevent chronic pain and prevent something they really don't need? It's by digging deeper. It's about asking those questions. It's about figuring out that's been going on for a while. Uh, understanding this is not a tendonitis. If it's been happening five times a year, six times a year for the last several years, it's worse with sleeping. It's figuring out the exact tissue of injury. In this case with John, it's probably a little bit of tendinosis, meaning he's got some degenerated tissue in there. What are you going to do for that patient? I'm not going to be nice to it. I'm not going to pat him on the back and say, you'll be all right in two weeks. Uh, get some bed rest and two ibuprofen and I'll see you on Wednesday. I'm going to be mean to him. I'm going to take a dull screwdriver and I'm going to scrape the crap out of it. And I'm going to create a localized inflammatory reaction to help him. So having the right diagnosis gives me the confidence to know what's going on with the patient and how I'm going to help him most effectively. I'm not going to give him nice exercises. I'm not going to tell him to stay home and rest and do those kind of things. I'm actually going to give him eccentric exercises. I'm going to have him picking weights above his head, heavy weights, and make sure that we can get him moving as best as possible. And that helps a lot of patients.
If I just did an evaluation, if I just did his imaging, that would get me to where I got right now. But if I don't ask the rest of the questions, then I'm peeing in the wind. Uh, and I, I really believe that because if I don't actually ask him the question of what's making this worse, and I don't understand that that's a tendinosis that requires blood flow, uh, that requires a healing process, requires some rehab exercises to build up that tissue resiliency, uh, he's going to feel a little better at the beginning, but then it's going to come right back. So really digging into that 1%. If this is John here and he goes home and sleeps on his shoulder every single day and we don't uh, find ways to avoid ischemia or ecstatic compression to that tissue like he's going to do here. If I don't change his posture, which we know from uh, the studies back um, in 2015, uh, that if you have ideal posture, uh, you have a less than 2% chance of having an asymptomatic rotator cuff tear. Uh, if you have a sway back posture, hyperkyphosis posture, uh, your chances of asymptomatic rotator cuff tear of the shoulder increases past 50%. So posture makes a big deal in here. So we really need to make sure that we're attacking all those little pieces of the puzzle to help our patients get out of pain. And that brings me to this slide. So how knowledgeable are you to prevent chronic pain? In this case, the shoulder, but it's the same continuum for every single uh, other diagnosis we see in the body. Are you treating everything as a sprain strain? Are you asking more questions and having people decide, are they possibly just a, a superstitious partial tear? Do they have tendinosis? Or do they have tendinosis and they have a little bit of ADL uh, reasons uh, why they're having this pain uh, progressively get worse and not get better? How many of those things do you think about on a day? How many of those things do you address with your patients? Being an evidence-based provider and being someone that's going to attack and hopefully prevent chronic pain, we need to be looking at these things for every single patient. The vast majority of our patients are going to have a pain or a problem, and we're going to help them get out of pain with usually uh, mostly passive interventions and a little bit of active intervention to get them out of the pain. But these patients need a little bit something more. Uh, we have to be sure that we understand what we can treat, what we can't treat, and sometimes when we need a little bit of help. And I think that, uh, I think it was a Schneider paper in, uh, I think it was 2016, uh, but he did a, a, a survey, I think it was in Australia, I know it was in Canada, uh, but he surveyed people on evidence-based care. And I found this very interesting that um, over 75% of the people who responded liked evidence-based care. 90% um, wanted to be an evidence-based provider, but uh, about half of them actually did things that correlated with the literature. There's a knowledge transfer loss, meaning we learn things in our, uh, in our classes and our seminars and uh, with doing research or through uh, you know, any kind of method, peer reviewed research or looking on Google, we learn all these things. However, we can't relay that stuff to our patients in a coordinated fashion to help them get out of pain. This knowledge transfer loss is critical with chronic pain patients. We have to uh, learn as much about the patient as possible. We have to convey everything that we know about this patient. And then we have to educate them enough that they are an equal partner in getting this problem to go away. And that's when you have evidence-based care. That's when you have patient-centered care. And that's when you have a very satisfied patient patient with your care. I know I use the example of a shoulder, but this goes uh, in the same process for multiple different regions of the body. How capable are you of coming up with the right diagnosis to help solve that patient's problem? I automate 98% of what I do in practice, meaning I am like a machine line as far as my practice. That doesn't mean that I treat every patient the same though. Uh, that means that there is a standard of care for treating rotator cuff tendinosis. There is a standard of care for treating uh, plantar fasciitis and um, uh, cervicogenic headaches. And I can automate those things, manipulation, soft tissue release, this modality, that modality, these rehab exercises. Uh, and it works almost every single time. The difference is that one to two percent. That's the part that get creative in. That's when you can start to dig into someone's life and find that trigger, find that activity, find that posture that's leading to this ongoing pain problem. That's when you can dig into your life and really get to the bottom, the root uh, cause behind behind these pains and problems. So we get to learn from our patients, uh, but also our patients are in the process of learning about their pain. 
I call it, well, I shouldn't say I call it, it's not trademark to me, uh, but physiologic learning. And we, uh, I uh, learned in, in school that you learn in the brain. And that's, that's just not true. Um, you learn to be in pain at three different parts in your body. Um, that this physiologic response is happening uh, not only in, in the brain, but it's also happening in the spinal cord and it's also happening in the periphery. Um, so that's the, the biggest piece of this. But the cool part about that is that means there's three insertion points. I don't need to just do pain education and say, hey, I know you hit your thumb with a hammer, but the pain's in your head. That's wrong, period. Uh, the pain's at the thumb. Um, it's just being transmitted up to the brain. Now, if you do that every single day, um, then there's, uh, well, something clinically wrong with you. Um, however, then it could be from all three points. So the real question is, is how well can you affect all three sites? Um, and I think that therapy that's targeted at all three sites, that's multifactorial, it's changing someone's habits, it's changing their education, it's changing um, the, uh, the sensitivity of the neurons through diet, through injections, um, through manipulation, through myofascial release. How many of these things are you capable of doing? How many are you willing to do? And what parts aren't you capable, willing, or licensed to do? And that's okay. And what I'm here to tell you is that it's perfectly fine to send someone out for massage therapy, for an epidural steroid injection, to a psychologist sometimes, to a nutritionist, if you're not the best person for that uh, to solve that problem or the best person to solve uh, pain at that insertion point. It builds a referral network within your community uh, that's unparalleled and builds evidence-based practices. Let's start with the first. The first is at the peripheral tissue. This is where most of us think about pain uh, coming into the body or, or we sense pain. This primary neuron is everywhere. This is how we're picking up our, our sensory organs. Um, now, most of the time we're gonna have some kind of tissue injury, compression, stretch, or, or frank tissue injury where that primary neuron is gonna be activated. We have pro-inflammatory cytokines that says, hey, uh, that's gonna release these prostaglandins in these area. And the neuron says, problem. Uh, uh, and I'm going to send um, this signal over to the spinal cord. However, that tissue gets really good at being in pain. Um, that if you ha you can actually start to up and down regulate these uh, the cytokine cytokine re um, uh, release with uh, repetitive activities. Um, so you can really train your body to be in pain, uh, and we see that over and over again. In fact, uh, if we have degenerated joints, if we have um, IBS, uh, if we have muscular imbalance, if we have inflammation, um, all these things are chronic, noxious stimulus releasing pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, to tell our body that we're in pain. These are things though that are exciting now because these are things that can be caused pain and that we can identify, we can label, and we can help solve. The next is going to be the secondary neuron. The secondary neuron is not something that is uh, untouchable. Well, I guess it is untouchable, but we can affect it. Um, this is something that we often think about spinal cord stimulators. We often think about um, uh, opioids. We often think about medication, uh, fusions, uh, epidural steroid injections as the only insertion point to this area. However, this is where the first in the second neuron um, decazate. This is somewhere where they, when that synapse, we can have an impact on. Uh, we can do both psychology, we do with exercise, is that this is something that we can really have an impact that just, it's not only um, our medications, it's not only um, uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors that can help with these kind of problems, is that we can really have an impact on this area with conservative measures. Now, once we have this uh, decazation up into the um, uh, spinal cord, it's gonna go up into the third order neuron and we're going to have this in this matosensory cortex where we know exactly where the pain is coming from. So after the relay in the thalamus, however, this is another site that we can have an impact on uh, as far as learning to be in pain, learning the difference between hurt, learning the difference between harm, learning how this pain or problem happened. Sometimes that's the biggest uh, answer that we need to uh, come up with um, with a patient to help them understand their problem just as well as we do to help all of us work towards a solution. So what do we do to solve the problem of pain? 
And I dug deep into the research to figure that problem out. And as it turns out, there's an answer. Um, and in our current model of healthcare, the answer is depending on who you see. Uh, it's dependent, not necessarily just on who you see, it's their payment model, which determines which treatment you get. Um, some of them have effectiveness, some don't. Um, some look at one site of dysfunction, and that's all they do is provide this one treatment, this one epidural steroid injection. This is going to fix your chronic pain. I'm going to fix nutrition. That's going to fix your chronic pain. I'm going to do manipulation. That's going to fix your chronic pain. Um, that's not right. That's not right. The science doesn't support it. It may be your belief system. It may be your opinion. And for some people, it may help. However, just affecting one site is not good enough. It's not good enough for you as a practitioner, and it's not good enough for your patient. I always use the word peddling, and people take offense to that, but that it comes down to that. Because if you're selling one solution to fix every problem, you're peddling a solution. It's not correct. Now, can you only perform one solution? Absolutely. 100%. That's what we do. We're, we're great with our hands. We're great with patient education. But sometimes, don't forget about what else we could, we could be doing for somebody. We can use medications. We can use hormone replacement. We can use rehabilitation. We can use a psychologist. Whatever it is that patient may need and whatever fits into your uh, hierarchy to get that person out of pain. But don't put your beliefs on that patient and say, this is the only way we're going get to get you out of pain. Be open to other sorts of modalities. Uh, often I have people at a, a live event raise their hand. How many people here believe steroid injections work? And hardly anyone raised their hand. And that's not true. The simple fact is the people that it did work didn't come back in to see you. Uh, in fact, they didn't go back to see the pain manager doctor because it helped. It took them out of pain. We see their failures. They see our failures. If we can develop a healthcare system where we all see each other's patients and we can all provide that one insertion point of therapy, maybe it's manipulation, uh, maybe it's nutrition, and we can help people get all their sites of dysfunction to clean out, then we can really have a positive impact because they're not going to be developing those new painful memories. So what can we do? Um, and as it turns out, there's a lot of things that we can do in office that work really well and are evidence-based. Uh, what are the things that we can do to impact the primary neuron? Uh, these are the things that are causing chronic pain. It could be a joint restriction. It could be, like I said before, uh, a digestive issue, uh, just chronic inflammation. Uh, it could be a lot of different things perpetuating the system, sensitizing these peripheral uh, neurons and causing these pain signals. There's a lot of times where it's just a degenerated joint where that structure is so bad that every time they try to do an activity, it hurts. Well, at some point, you might have to replace that joint. Uh, us digging our heads in the sand, a patient digging their head in the sand isn't the best idea for some people because that peripheral sensitizer of pain is going to get actually into the head. It's going to cause them to move differently, to think differently. Sometimes it's good to get that joint, get that full range of motion back at that joint uh, before you can move on with getting them out of the pain for another problem. One other thing, what the research says is who else should be helping that peripheral neuron uh, be desensitized? These guys, um, uh, passive, mobilization, manipulation. Um, I don't care what you do, whatever you're great at, do it. Get the body moving, get your hands on this person, find the muscles that are tight, find trigger points, do dry kneeling. I, the, the research is there, do it. Um, however, what else could you be doing? Nutrition. Uh, nutrition is great at decreasing inflammation in peripheral tissue. Um, eat better. Now, uh, I would rather change your religion than change what you eat. Uh, I'm just not good at it. It's not what I do in my practice. It's not that I don't see benefit in it. I see immense benefit in working on someone's nutrition and health. Uh, but I send someone down the street for that. I found someone else in my community that does a phenomenal job at that. And I let them do what they're great at. I do what I'm great at. I am musculoskeletal care, acute care only. They they kind of migrate over into nutrition. That's great. They're a Cairo. We can cross refer all day long. 
uh, a lot of times what the nutritionists are the, uh, the research says is just eliminating certain things uh, one don't drink your calories uh, s stop drinking soda for, for God's sake um, cutting out dairy cutting out gluten those are all easy effective ways to drop down inflammation and allow this person to heal uh, sometimes that we have to address the heart issues. Uh, obesity, as it is, is pro-inflammatory. It is what it is. Uh, that person knows they need to lose weight, so do you. Uh, really dive in and find out why that person is being inactive and get them moving again or refer out. Refer to someone else. That, that's their jam. That's what they do. Um, but find a way to help with this because it will dramatically impact your clinical results having a person be more healthy. Secondary neuron. Uh, what can we do with this dorsal root to prevent that wind-up phenomena that leads to chronic pain? Uh, this is the reason we have the opioid epidemic. And now we can use things like CBD oil, which also has a dramatic impact at the substantia gelatinosa uh, to help um, uh, prevent that serotonin. However, we can also do other things. Uh, we can do things like exercise. We can do things like getting outside and taking a walk. Uh, as crazy as that sounds uh, in these last couple of years, However, just having a positive belief about your situation can impact the psychology and decrease their pain. Using positive words in your practice will go a long way. We see that from every single paper, uh, that optimism um, and a sense of a pathway to get them out of pain is um, one of the biggest things to help these patients recover from their condition. We can also use things like medication, and people will always balk at that. Um, medications work. Like it or not, they work. Um, however, use them long term, they can have detrimental side effects. Um, so th using things like acetaminophen, using things like uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitor, or drugs uh, can dramatically impact a patient's pain. Just don't tell them that's the only thing keeping them out of pain. Those pain relievers are a window of opportunity. And that when you have that window, now is the time to do the things that's going to help you get out of pain for good, which involves exercise, activity, sleep, not sleeping on your shoulder, uh, those are doing some rehab exercises. Uh, those are things that are going to desensitize the entire system and get somebody back to their pain. There's things like CBD oil. There's things like spinal cord injections. Uh, there are things called spinal cord stimulators that also can affect the, uh, affect the spinal um, cord um, in, in, in its location. Uh, those all work. Uh, they don't work on everybody. Um, and it's partially because we only do one intervention. For peer-reviewed literature to work, we can only have so many variables in the pot. Otherwise, the, uh, the science breaks down. Uh, if we could just do all of them at once, we could do manipulation, myofascial release, and injection, exercise, change their diet. Imagine the impact we could have on our patients. Uh, but, but exercise uh, and, and injections are a big thing to help people in chronic pain. Second order neuron, um, this is the one that I focus on probably the most in practice, uh, is attention and distraction. Um, and the reason for that is, is sometimes people are so focused on their pain, they can't focus on anything else. Uh, and then if we can find a way to actually focus on something else, uh, we can have a dramatic impact on pain. Even spinal cord reflexes, by focusing on something else, you can up and down regulate your spinal cord reflexes. The same thing with distraction, uh, is that if we can focus on something else, uh, in fact, I think it was this Van Dam study, this is 2009, but they just had them do something else. If you're running, um, don't focus on your arm swing, don't focus on your cadence, don't focus on your stride width, uh, your tempo. Watch a movie. Um, you focus on something else. Uh, have a dramatic impact on pain relief. And now there, of course, there's things you can do with gate that are going to help people, orthotics and manual therapy, but also don't have them focus on too much. Uh, that can also become detrimental. Uh, the last piece of this um, is this... Uh, as we age, um, we're not able to control our pain as much. Uh, there's other things that we can't control as much like driving, um, but we can only do so much in our clinics. Uh, but as we age, our psychological and our motor uh, systems do decline. Um, so keep that um, in mind when you're working with patients. Understand their level of um, adherence to care depends on their understanding of what's wrong with them. If you throw out 17 different things for that person to do, they're going to remember one or two and then call you a bad name when they go home to talk to their spouse about you. Uh, so really focus on what's important and don't focus on its entirety, at least not day one. What else can you do for patients? Uh, this is the, the, the brain. Um, so the third order neuron, once you hit the thalamus and up to the cortex, um, this is where you perceive pain.
best things you can do for these patients is to educate them. It's not necessarily just telling them they have pain or they have a problem. It's really giving them the tools to understand why they're being affected by chronic pain, how there is a musculoskeletal component, how there is a peripheral component to it, but also there are other things at play. And that's the reason we need to send them for this, uh, this referral, for this medication, for this uh, consult with the nutritionist. That's why we need to do more things for these patients as compared to just saying, well, let's try this for two weeks and let's see what happens. Let's give them a pathway for their persistent pain that is not necessarily just what we have to offer, but it's what the patient needs. Explain Pain is a great book by David Butler. Uh, uh, there's, you could use infographics in your, in your practice um, and little patient uh, handouts as far, as far as education on what chronic pain is or chronic pain diagnoses uh, to help them solve their problem. Very similar to that rotator cuff analogy, that if I just treat that person with uh, myofascial release, with spinal manipulation, uh, and I forget exercise, they're probably not going to get as well as fast or well at all. If I do all those things, but then forget about uh, a scapular stability exercise or forget about the sleeping on their shoulder, um, then I'm not gonna get them as well as fast. So considering all the aspects, uh, all the insertion points of pain when you're treating these patients can go a long way. Um, and that's how you turn that patient who came in on a Wednesday and was that much better on Friday and you keep them feeling that good as compared to only changing one thing, which is a little bit of confidence and, and positive reinsurance and their pain comes back. You can also please stop talking about structure as the sole cause of their pain. It's wrong, uh, it's, uh, it's riddled throughout the literature, it's just not the case and often not fixable. Now, in the, this is of course in the absence of red flags or trauma. Uh, now, can spinal structure affect pain? Absolutely. Uh, can spinal curves affect pain? It's possible, there is some research on that. However, it's not the only variable. Uh, so make sure you're still attacking everything else and don't uh, show them degeneration. This is pain and you know causing your lower back pain. That's wrong. As far as things you can do that are simple for your patients, um, get them outside, get them a friend, get them a hobby, uh, give them an activity to do. I know with my parents, I have them you know, park in the very back of Target before walking in, uh, utilize some distraction techniques, focus on this, listen to a podcast while you walk, focusing on something else because kinesiophobia or the, the fear of movement can really debilitate somebody. I, 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 I've never experienced this, but can you imagine knowing that if you got on the floor that you couldn't get back off the floor? How debilitating is that? How many things would you not do in your own house if that were the case? Uh, also, fear of movement isn't just uh, can affect the musculoskeletal system. Uh, what we know from research is that it also affects the autonomic system um, and it, it really affects a pain intensity being people that they think it's going to hurt, it is going to hurt. Um, so rephrasing those uh, lines of communication with, I think we call them John at the very beginning, that when he picks his arm up at 100 degrees, but you know he's not doing any extra damage, John, that's okay, let's keep on doing the exercise. If you're doing eccentric exercises, you should have a little bit of pain. You should have pain between a one and three out of 10, four out of 10. Now, if it gets higher than that, we might be doing something wrong or something too quick or too fast. Uh, but don't be afraid to go into the um, uh, the hurt realm as far as getting these people out of pain. Just don't go into the harm realm. And it takes obviously some clinical expertise on their end to know what is the difference between hurt and harm and getting people to, to help themselves and to understand there might be a little discomfort going along with that. Uh, because when people jump into the quick fixes, like surgeries, and we see this all the time with neurosurgery, and that's not a knock against neurosurgery, it's the patient. The patients um, want to fast track themselves out of pain, and who wouldn't? Um, however, uh, whenever you do have any kind of uh, you know, traumatic injury um, or a surgery that does break the integrity of that joint, you will have accelerated osteoarthritis. Um, and unfortunately, it increases very fast. Uh, within five to 15 years after any kind of a surgery, it is going to accelerate that degenerative process. Um, so we really, really, really wanna make sure that's the, the last ditch effort um, of going into surgery. We wanna explore every other option. Also consider what that patient does for a living. Uh, other things, are there movement hab, uh, patterns? Are there uh, habits they do that actually put themselves in pain instead of help them get out of pain? Whether they're kneeling, whether they're doing repetitive 
repetitive lifting. Uh, whether they're in the same case, whether they have their elbow out when they're picking their arm versus arm adducted. Those are the little small nuances that can help people get out of discomfort. Just taking someone with rotator cuff syndrome and having them sleep on the other side. If they have a you know, gluteal tendon out, or even if they have vertigo, uh, finding different ways to change your positions and postures to help get them out of pain. It's not a substitute for what we do as chiropractors. It's, it's, it's just, it's additive. It's going to help you along your, your process of uh, attacking all the variables that are gonna help that patient. Also, don't stop people from doing what they love. Now, there are some cases where they just can't keep on doing their activity, but what we know is that things like running, things uh, like certain sports aren't necessarily the cause of their pain. Don't just tell people to stop doing what they love. Find a way around it. Uh, find that I want you to start walking. You can't run slow or walk fast. Um, you know, find different strategies to get that person to do what they love because what we know is that can really feed into the uh, depression that we see with chronic pain patients. So to kind of close things up um, as far as this, uh, this conversation, um, I think that we can remove a lot of the fear of chronic pain patients with science. Uh, and it comes down to your words matter. Uh, not using enough words, um, so not having enough knowledge to educate your patients on everything they can do to help get themselves out of pain uh, is a problem. Or using the wrong words can actually facilitate pain. Um, and uh, stopping them from doing things they love and things they want to do uh, because we use words like, hey, that degenerated L5 is going to cause you pain for the rest of your life. That's, that, that's depressing in and of itself. Uh, one, because they can't move anyone, but even more because it's wrong. Um, so we need to make sure that if someone can't get on the floor, we teach them how to get off the floor. If someone has pain with walking, we find out how to get them better walking, but do it from a top down and a bottom up approach because we need people to squat. We need people to keep on working. That if we keep people off work, disability rates increase. As a portal of entry provider, it is my duty to help triage this patient with the most exact diagnosis. That diagnosis does not take me a half an hour. It does not take me an hour to come up with. It takes a good history, a good evaluation, and an even better line of communication with my patients. Your patient education is the number one thing you can do. Having your patients understand their condition just as well as you do will build compliance and adherence to your treatment plans. When people don't come back to see you, that's because they don't understand why they have to come back. If you have a very clear treatment plan of what you're gonna to do to help solve their problem, what they can do to help solve their problem, um, then your compliance rates go up and patient satisfaction. Uh, in closing, uh, I am sponsored by Cairo Up. Uh, that's what we do, patient education. It's there so I can automate the 99% of what I do. I type in, John Smith has rotator cuff syndrome. It pulls out and sends to an app all their exercises, all the patient education information, all their ADL modifications based on that diagnosis. Uh, with one minute of your time, Cairo can automate 99% of the things that need to be relayed to that patient. Uh, it doesn't It doesn't change what you do. It helps educate you in all the things you can do, but it's additive. Uh, it helps your patients get out of pain. It helps them understand what they could do differently in your life. Uh, if you want to check us out, uh, you can go to chiropractic.com. It's a free trial, um, and it's something that really has been additive to my practice. Selfishly, I created it just to make my life easier in practice, um, and I couldn't imagine practicing without it. Thank you so much for listening to this one-hour presentation. If you have any questions, uh, my email is brandon, B-R-A-N-D-O-N, at chiroup.com, C-H-I-R-O-U-P.com. Uh, once again, thanks for listening, and uh, please email me any questions, concerns, uh, comments, or even a couple of criticisms. Uh, thanks for listening.